Right, well, I'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, um, November lecture. This is our prestigious lecture jointly with the CIE, uh, CSI rather, uh, and I hope that uh, a few more people will be joining us shortly. I'd just like to give a bit of publicity to our next event. Um, and I'll uh, I'll just share my screen to show the poster. Uh, our next event is a, a panel discussion on plastic recycling for the future. Uh, and we have a, a panel of experts coming to talk to us, which has just disappeared from my screen. Um, Dr. David Hughes, who's one of our council members and is also chair of the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining Polymer Committee, will be chairing the event. Um, and we've got, uh, as you can see from the poster, we've got a panel of other experts to uh, to aid the discussions. Uh, each panel member will give us a little talk for about five minutes on their particular aspect of recycling. And then uh, we shall throw throw it open to questions from the floor. Uh, we're trialling a lunchtime event with this. It's at 12.30, not our normal six o'clock. So it will be interesting to see uh, how many people we can get attending that. It, it will be online, so uh, people will be able to sit at their desk with their sandwiches, as it were, and, uh, uh, and join in with us. Right, I'll just uh, stop sharing that and go back to the main view. We've got a, a few more people joining. Right, I think in that case, we'll hand over to you, Paul, if you'd like to uh, uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell so us a bit about will. yourself before you start. So, um, I'll, I'll just, just make you the presenter. Thank you. Okay, over to you. That's started sharing. Doesn't yeah, uh, that sharing, it's um, not screen view yet, though. Yeah. That's it. So Excellent. Uh, as Sue says, my name is uh, Paul Butler. I'm the Chief Executive of the North East Automotive Alliance. I've uh, been involved in clusters since around 2001. Um, did spend 10 years um, with NEPIC as part of their management team. Became a, a benchmarking expert for cluster management excellence uh, for Europe. Um, and at that time, I led a, a project for NEPIC, which led to the formation of the NEA back in 2015. My current role, uh, I now represent the sector on various industry boards, uh, regional with the uh, with the LEPS, um, national with Bayes, the Automotive Council, and also on some European automotive cluster um, boards as well. Um, I sit on the main board and also chair the industry four group, but then also sit on a number of other innovation strands, such as connected autonomous mobility as well. In terms of the NEAA, we were established in March 2015 um, with the largest automotive cluster in the UK. Currently, have just over 270 member companies, and we've got 13 working groups which are focused around five key thematic areas, one of which is manufacturing innovation uh, and technology, uh, skills, network and connectivity, trade and investment. So, um, in terms of the NEA, uh, we, we were established in 2015, largest automotive cluster in the, in the UK. Um, really, our vision is for the Northeast Automotive Alliance to be the catalyst through which the Northeast becomes the loca uh, location of choice for automotive investment in Europe, and to be recognised as a region as a true automotive powerhouse with a very forward and dynamic looking uh, and competitive supply chain, but also with strengths in research, development and innovation in both new manufacturing technologies and also the um, the new automotive technologies as well. So today I'm going to give you an insight into the sector, the current trends, and see some of the key innovation challenges faced by the sector. Um, I've no doubt though, um, some of your sessions have, uh, have been quite technical and, and this won't be as technical, but I'm hoping it will highlight some of the key areas uh, of interest to yourselves. So just a little bit about the automotive sector. So we we are a, a significant sector for the UK economy. We we currently, well, in 2020, turn over uh, 60.2 billion. 
Um, that is significantly down on uh, normal um, conditions back in 2019. The, the turnover was uh, some 82 billion. If you look at the cars manufactured, um, we produced in 2020 just over 920,000. Again, that was significantly down, some 30% down on uh, on last year, and 45% down of our peak in 2017. At a time in 2017 where we expected the sector to to continue to grow and output to increase significantly, but then we've been impacted by the likes of diesel gates. Um, then with COVID, um, and now with, with other significant uh, supply chain um, issues as well, which I'll come on to in a second. I guess the one thing to highlight in here is the, uh, the support from the government is extremely strong uh, for the sector. And all of the organisations you can see that have a very close working relationship with the sector. I would say one of the, the most influential bodies is definitely the Automotive Council. They've really been at the background uh, of uh, the automotive sector's renaissance since uh, some of the, the low periods we had um, back in the, uh, the 70s and 80s. Just in terms of uh, some of the challenges, um, even before COVID, um, the pace of change within the automotive sector was, was unprecedented. I know when talking to some of the, the OEMs, they were stating they expected to see more change in the next eight to 10 years than we have in its entire history to date. So if you think of a, a Tesla today against um, one of the first vehicles uh, produced in the top left hand corner, and you think of the amount of change that's occurred there, yet in the next eight to 10 years, we're gonna see more change than that. That's quite quite phenomenal to think of where this, the sector's actually going. Um, a lot of this change was driven by environmental concerns and uh, which were driving legislation with net zero 2050 and uh, as we're seeing at the moment, COP26. Also around safety and congestion pressures, uh, we've seen driver assist technology really develop um, significantly and that's had a major impact on um, the, uh, in, in terms of reducing accidents. Just looking at, say, the forward collision warning on a, on a vehicle with auto brake, that's led to a 50% reduction of uh, front, front end to rear end crashes in the sector. We're also seeing significant customer changes. And one of the strategies for the sector is for OEMs to look at um, uh, increasing the level of customization. And a, a prime example of that, if you think about the, the new minis today, I, I had a factory tour about two years ago. Um, and when we were going around, they were, they were explaining the level of customization within that. They produced just over 2 million minis in that uh, facility. And they only, uh, they've only duplicated two cars in that entire production, such as the level of, uh, of customization going into them. And then of course, we've also got the industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution in terms of automation and digital technologies, which is really causing a significant paradigm shift in our manufacturing processes. And then more recently, we've been um, headed, uh, facing some more um, headwinds in terms of uh, supply chain issues around semiconductor uh, supply and availability, and also global shipping. Um, which is largely a hangover from uh, from the COVID impact. In terms of the Northeast, most people associate the Northeast automotive in industry with that of Nissan, um, but our history goes way back. Um, back in 1908, uh, Gladstone Adams actually invented the, the windscreen wiper. He set off to watch an, uh, um, Newcastle in what, what I believe was the and the last FA Cup final they appeared in back in 1908. And he was having to stop to, to wipe the snow away from his window and he invented the, uh, the first windscreen wiper in the top left-hand corner there, which I think is in um, one of the museums in Newcastle. In 1920, our electrification heritage starts with Smith's, uh, Smith's electric vehicles making electric trams and buses before moving on to making electric milk carts in the 1950s, and then eventually on to, to making electric vans for Rinktons, one of their other family businesses. In 1961, we saw uh, Herbert Lobel OBE uh, found, 
founded Smith's Electric Vehicle Controllers, which was um, it became Sevcon. Uh, and then in 1973, we had uh, DJB Engineering manufacturing articulated trucks, and they were acquired by Caterpillar in 85. The first Japanese investment was about 1976 with NSK, before we then saw Nissan in 1986 and Komatsu um, in 87, and Libra Crane started production in, in Sunderland in 1989. I think one of the biggest influences in, in our sector is ob obviously been the growth of Nissan. Um, if you go back to when they started production in uh, 1986, uh, they had 407 employees and were producing about 5,000 cars per annum. At, at their peak, um, back in 2017-2018, uh, they were producing 500,000 cars a year with about seven uh, seven to seven and a half thousand employees and as they've grown so has the supply chain within the sector and i think one of the one of the advantages we have at the moment around electrification has been their foresight to look at investing in electrification they announced uh, the, the leaf in 2010 and the the first ever battery facility in europe in 2010 and they started production in 2013 uh, of the leaf and what became the first ever giga plant in Europe with the what is now the Envision facility. If we look at today, the sector's changed significantly. Um, pre pre COVID, we were turning over about 11 billion of sales within the, the region for the automotive industry. Um, we had the largest and most productive car plant um, with Nissan. Um, which produces um, UK's most successful vehicle in terms of the, the Nissan Qashqai, which was designed, developed and manufactured here in the UK. And if you just take the, the, the sheer success of that, if you just took um, Qashqai production alone, Nissan would still be the second biggest manufacturer in the UK. We've obviously been leaders in electrification, as I've mentioned, and more recently we've seen the announcement about their EV360 initiative, which is a, a billion investment to look at setting up a manufacturing ecosystem to support net zero with an electric vehicle at the, at the core, significant investment with Envision uh, around a, a, a brand new gigafactory, and also developing a, a microgrid to produce sustainable energy um, for, for the plant and the supply chain. We've also got three of the, the top five off highway manufacturers, significant engine producing capability with both Cummins and, uh, and Nissan, and a truly world-class supply chain. Um, I think as a region, we, when we look at automotive productivity, we sit on a pedestal uh, above even other parts of the, the UK's automotive sector. And I think some of that is, um, is really down to some of the stats around how productive our workforce is. So we produce in the region of uh, just over 16 vehicles per full-time employee within the sector. The UK average is 9.4 and uh, in the EU it's 7.1. And part of that is down to the level of automation. So we're, we're, we are highly automated as a sector. Um, if you look at some of the, um, the, the metrics for measuring that, um, Europe tends to use as the number of robots, industrial robots per 10,000 employees. Uh, in the northeast, we sit well over 500, and and that's just a calculation I've done with Nissan, the other OEMs, and and the tier ones. I've not gone to tier two and below to to calculate the figure. Um, European, uh, sorry, European leaders: Germany with 322 per 10,000, and Singapore is a global leader with 918. When you look at that compared to the UK, we sit at uh, 24th globally with 89 industrial robots per 10,000 employees. And then we wonder why we've got a, a productivity issue here in the UK. I guess one, uh, some of the other highlights is, is the fact we are a leading late, uh, region for electrification, as I've touched on. Um, we have a, a truly um, a globally competitive supply chain from electrification perspective as well. We're the only region making over a million electric motors per annum. Um, we've got Europe's first ever gigafactory. We'll see two new gigafactories coming in. And even just since December last year, we've seen 3.85 billion of investment announced for the Northeast in electrification. 
So huge opportunities for us in that space. So um, just coming over to, to some of the, the opportunities we've got and some, some of the key innovation challenges. Um, these are faced by not just the OEMs, but the entire automotive sector. And whilst they are challenges, they do provide some significant opportunities for us as a, as, as a region and a sector. So um, in terms of vehicle electrification in the top left hand corner, that's obviously driven by the global mega trend to look at electrifying um, uh, uh, vehicles and particularly driven by the, the fact we're going to see internal combustion engines banned um, in 2030 in terms of new car sales. Hybrid technology will be banned in 2035 and all road vehicles by 2040. So no new vehicles will have an internal combustion engine uh, by 2040. Um, industrial digitalization, it's a huge opportunity for us. I've mentioned that we are um, highly productive from a work, workforce perspe uh, perspective and that we are highly automated. We recognize that actually industrial digitalization is the next step change in, in terms of our um, productivity and also in terms of our operational efficiency and therefore competitiveness. Then we, we look at connected autonomous mobility and in particular looking at last mile logistics and how we can automate that. I sat on a group, um, a UK group recently with uh, um, uh, a government minister talking about where the key opportunities were for connected autonomous mobility. And there was a general consensus that actually the, the best place to de deploy those technologies is initially in controlled environments where you've got private roads and you can control uh, the access there and also the vehicle flows on, uh, on those roads. We can then develop the technologies to a stage before rolling them out onto the public road. So we, the, there was a, a broad consensus that that really is the first commercial opportunity for connected autonomous mobility. <clears throat> then we've got the net zero challenge, not just in terms of how we decarbonize the vehicles, but also how we decarbonize the manufacturing process uh, as well. And in the promotion of this event, um, it did state I was going to talk about net zero, but in, in pulling together the, um, the presentation, I think we're at too an earlier stage to really get in, into detail about where some of the opportunities are in that space. But as we start to progress that opportunity, I know that it's going to be uh, energy efficiency and reducing consumption is going to be one of the key areas of focus as is looking at how we can um, come off of the uh, off the grid and, and self-generate uh, energy, but also looking at how we record carbon footprint across the entire supply chain, which is going to be a significant um, challenge, but is, is definitely a, uh, a need we've got for the sector going forward. So today, I'm just going to highlight three of the, the more immediate opportunities in terms of electrification, what we're doing there, digitization, and also connected and, and autonomous logistics. So just moving on to electrification, um, as I've stated, it really is um, environmental legislation that's driving uh, the, uh, the ban on internal combustion engine. Um, it stated that passenger vehicles um, will be banned by 2030. However, um, the sector is confident the public will move before that because there's there's always a worry about residual value, uh, uh, values of vehicles. And we saw that with diesel cars. As soon as the government started talking about uh, increased road tax and new legislation coming in about diesel cars and in particular the NOx emissions, then we saw a, a dramatic drop in sales of diesel vehicles. And I did a presentation uh, last week, uh, sorry, the week before, and diesel vehicles, if you go back to 2016, they were just over 50% of all new vehicles sold. Um, last month, it was 8%. And that shows you how quickly the, uh, the sector has moved. And we, we recognize that this is um, going to happen with electrification as, as well. So it is a global challenge, a global race for electrification. All the OEMs are looking at how they can uh, electrify their products as, as quickly as possible. And in talking to some of the OEMs, there has been announcements that, uh, particularly with JLR and, uh, and Ford, 
they've said by 2025, all of their powertrain will be fully electrified. And one of the one of the key trends we're seeing as well is there there now seems to be a move to skip hybrid, and there seems to be much more of a move towards full EV as well. So just uh, coming in uh, into the northeast, as I've mentioned before, we're we're in a great position to look at capitalising on um, the electrification opportunity. Um, we've got Leaf, which is Europe's most successful battery electric vehicle. We're seeing the Qashqai with its first deployment of the uh, the Nissan's innovative e power powertrain solution. We've seen the announcements that. Um, they're investing in a, in a brand new EV crossover as part of the EV360 announcement. And they've also stated that all crossovers will be fully electrified. So I expect the Duke to be electrified in, in the future uh, as well. And it's not just limited to Nissan. If you look at the other OEMs in the region, Komatsu um, manufacture excavators in, in Berkeley, um, they launched a very successful hybrid um, uh, excavator uh, a few years ago, and they're now developing a fully electric version, which is being developed um, in Japan, but for the European market. And I, I given our electrification capability, um, I fully believe that we'll see that excavator come to the UK and into Berkeley to be manufactured for the European market. Even Libra cranes um, have got an electrified mobile harbour crane. And Caterpillar, the other, the other key OEM, whilst they don't have any current um, uh, electrified um, articulated trucks um, in production at the moment, I do know they're involved in uh, a number of electrification programmes. Um, that information is publicly available through Innovate UK. You can see the, the programmes they're involved in there. But as I mentioned before, we also have the, uh, the supply chain uh, capability. So only region with the full PEMD capability, which is power electric, uh, power uh, electric machines and drives. Um, we make over 1 million electric motors and also have the UK's biggest automotive power electronics manufacturing plant with ZF at Peter Lee. Um, we've got an awful lot of, uh, of capability and research going on in the region as well. Um, 18 of the 22 R&D centres focused on the automotive sector uh, have a, a focus on uh, electrification. And I guess the key one there is the driving the electric revolution, which is a, a national programme being led by uh, Newcastle University, which has seen a 6 million investment into new uh, innovative and scalable PEMD assembly line in, um, in Sunderland. And that's key for us to be able to look at scaling PEMD manufacturing uh, quickly in order to meet the volume targets we've got, um, which will probably hit us about 2025, as I mentioned. Just coming on to the investment, um, I mentioned we've seen 3.85 billion of investment since December. Um, we've seen Bridgeville with 2.6 billion in the top left hand corner, huge supply chain opportunities there. We've seen EV360 in the bottom right with a billion investment. We've seen Turn to Med Transport, um, which is, uh, uh, have acquired three businesses in the, uh, in the Northeast, Hyperdrive, um, Borg Warner and Avid Technology for just over 100 million. And in Teesside, we've obviously seen Peak Resources setting up a rare earth uh, refinery, um, about 112 million. And I do know there's some significant other programs as well. Um, likes of Cummins have got some uh, a number of electrification programs ongoing at the moment as well. So there's a huge opportunity and huge amount of activity taking place around electrification. One of the things we're trying to do as, uh, as a cluster organization is we've um, organized or, or established a, a brand called EV North. Um, and we're really looking to how we can capitalize on this, uh, this opportunity of our uh, existing capability, also looking to grow that, but then how we can work with the, all the, the myriad of, uh, of government departments to make sure our sector and our region maximizes the opportunity. So, We'll be working very closely with those partners on the right hand side to, to provide a gateway into our membership, but also to provide a, a gateway from our membership into these organizations to make sure our, our companies 
of participating in uh, funding calls to uh, make sure we've got the, the right uh, and the, the best solution providers coming forward to work with us as we try to um, realise our ambition of, uh, of securing that additional business here. Um, in terms of the EV North vision, uh, it's really about making sure um, we remain globally, a globally significant location for design, development and manufacture of electrified powertrain technologies and looking at how we can capitalise on that global me mega trend um, to really build upon existing regional assets, capabilities and skills in batteries, power electronics, electric motors and really increase the, the, the amount of R&D taking place in the region because that's that's one of the, the downsides of the automotive sector currently in the uh, in the northeast is there's not a lot of value added activity taking place. There's not many um, uh, a great deal of research activity taking place. It tends to take place in uh, in the in the home countries of the the OEMs. We're trying to attract more of that R and D activity into the region, and through EV North and working with the partners and UK government. We're starting to see that coming through. Part of the, the investments you're seeing coming through, the 3.85 billion, we will see more of that type of activity taking place in this region. And it's really about supporting that transition to become a true automotive power powerhouse and to be the, the location of choice uh, for a, a automotive investment in, in Europe. So that's just a quick canter through in terms of uh, electrification. Before I move on to industrial digitalization, do, does anyone have any questions about what, what I've covered there? Or do you want to save the questions for when, when I finish at the end? Uh, I think it's easiest if people want to ask questions, if they can type them into the chat box at the bottom right of the screen uh, and I'll uh, sort of facilitate questions at the end. Okay, perfect. Is okay. that okay with you, Paul? It, it certainly is, yeah. It makes it easier for me. Okay, no, we'll do that then. So, just moving on to industrial digitalization. As I mentioned previously, we, we really do believe this is the, the next um, step change in terms of our operational efficiency and in terms of our uh, improved competitiveness for, for a sector. Um, as we've stated, we are a beacon of productivity, and, and as we move towards that um, that drive towards an, an adoption of digital technologies, um, we've seen there's a number of key reports out there, and I'm sure most of you have, have seen the reports from Made Smarter, um, which sets out and highlights a, a potential opportunity from digital technologies of around a 30% productivity boost and adding something like 455 billion to the UK manufacturing sector. And there's a number of key programs that um, that's driving in terms of leadership, made smarter adoption, manufacturing made smarter and techno uh, technology accelerator, which I'll come on to in a, in a short while. There's also another really good report that SMMT produced with, along with KPMG, um, the one on the right there. They identified that by 2035, if we were to fully adopt the, um, the digital technologies, there'd be a 74 economic uh, benefit to UK PLC. So huge opportunities to this. Um, as a sector, um, we're really at the start of this journey and we're looking at how we move from the, the factory of now, which is there's levels of automation, but we, we tend to see the, the machines are isolated, specifically programmed, maintenance tends to be reactive, there's data islands existing between various parts of the plant and between the supply chain. And how we move towards that uh, factory of the future where they're connected data rich factories, fully integrated with fully transparent supply chains and connected supply chains highly automated smart machinery, self-diagnosis, and with the, the quick ability to, uh, to adapt to change and to, to change the manufacturing process, both in terms of the, the level of customization, but also in identifying where there's some, change, some, um, some delays in the supply chain and we can quickly change the, uh, the production schedules to react to that. And 
in order to achieve that, we've identified these uh, these building blocks as some of the key areas. Um, so integrated supply chains, traceability throughout that supply chain. One example we've been looking at within that, that area is um, currently, uh, if you take a, a, a Nissan vehicle, if you, you may have a, a tier four or five, you may have four or five different suppliers for the, for the same component. Um, if one of those component fails, there's no way of tracing that um, where, where the, the fault lies. Four of the suppliers could be, could be fine and one just having the problem. At the moment, Nissan would have to recall all of those vehicles. When you've got that end-to-end -end traceability and you can track where that components come from, you would only have to recall those vehicles linked to that, um, that supplier and probably that batch as well. So in terms of uh, efficiencies and, uh, and cost reduction for OEMs, that is huge. And you know, all the OEMs are looking at, at this as, as one of the key challenges for the sector. It's certainly something we, we discuss as part of the Auto Council digitization group. Then you've got smart robotics, connected workforces, and how we use um, digital technologies to help, uh, both in terms of decision making, but also in terms of reducing errors from operators on the shop floor. Digital twins, so we can quickly simulate any changes to the manufacturing process. Intelligent products, automated logistics, which I'll come on to in a, in a, a short while. Smart maintenance, defect protection, and, and build to order. Ultimately, we would the sector would like to get to a one to one um, build to order. So one order, um, one one car built to order from one customer. Um, at the moment, there's some build to um, uh, to to uh, some of the more common uh, common commonly purchased vehicles. Um, further down the line with high levels of customization, we're looking for that one-to-one. -one. And that'll be enabled by some of the, the key um, building blocks that you see in the, the bottom corner there as well. In terms of the NEAA, so um, the, the first phase of our activity and what we're looking to do is try and understand where um, companies currently are on their digital journey. So we've started by benchmarking um, digital readiness levels with um, with those companies on the bottom there, and we will expand it across the sector as well. Um, for this benchmarking exercise, we used um, the Hitachi Vantara's digital maturity assessment tool uh, for those interested in what tool we were using. And we chose uh, Hitachi because they, they're the world's 24th largest um, manufacturing business, but they're also the eighth largest technology company in the world. And within their portfolio, they do have their um, Omica Works, which has recently been recognized as a lighthouse facility by the World Economic Forum. So a true digital um, exemplar manufacturing facility. And their tool has been developed um, for their internal use, and they've used it with uh, over 800 operating companies within the Itachi family. And it's subsequently been rolled out and used by partner suppliers and clients of theirs. And I've had access to a lot of um, digital assessment tools through uh, DRL, through uh, some of the ones being used by Made Smarter and others that I've seen in development as well. And I have to say, for a large manufacturing business, the um, the Tachi Vantara is um, probably the best one I've seen out there. Just to give you an insight into some of the things we've found um, in terms of, so the, the image you can see there is the, uh, the aggregated value of um, uh, from all of those businesses. Um, but what we've found is operations, which is in the bottom right hand corner, operate, uh, uh, sorry, in uh, the bottom left hand corner, uh, operations was the joint highest, um, but I guess that's really, um, uh, it reflects on where companies are within the automotive sector. We are highly efficient. We were driven by operational excellence. So you would expect it to score well there. Also, when you look at the, the equal highest was digital culture. Um, and again, that's probably benefiting from the strong organization uh, culture that exists across the automotive sector as well. 
Um, within that, digital leadership was slightly lower than we expected, but it's probably reflective of where we are as a sector. We are, we've been, we've done the people productivity to the nth degree. We, we are highly automated, but in terms of digital, we're really setting out at the, at the start of that journey. And I believe we'll, we'll see these um, improve as, as companies develop their uh, industrial digitalization plans. In terms of vision and strategy, uh, executive alignment was extremely strong. Um, but again, I think that's given uh, our focus on operational efficiency. Um, people do understand the opportunity from digital, but where we, we lack the capability is understanding where digital technologies truly can make a difference to us. Um, and how we set those transformation goals and targets and looking at digital investment as well going forward. In terms of Made Smarter, I just wanted to, uh, to highlight um, a number of the programs that are um, linked into this. So we the, there's a Made Smarter Adoption Program, which um, the uh, runs across the northeast, which the Northeast Leppan Tees Valley Combined Authority um, are, are leading on. That is predominantly aimed at SMEs and will help them with fully funded advice uh, around technology experts, helping them set out a digital adoption program, looking at identifying the right digital tools to improve their business, and then looking at how they implement those new technologies within the organization. Um, that was based on a a program that was run out of, or a pilot that was run out of the Northwest, which is, uh, was a 20 million pound program and uh, looked to engage about 300, uh, 3,000 SMEs with 600 receiving a diagnostic and 480 of those going on to receive a grant to look at um, how they procured specialist support and, and equipment to implement digital technologies. It was highly successful. It's now been rolled out um, the funding for the Northeast uh, program um, was a single year funding. However, there's a, a, an expectation that uh, following the, the comprehensive spending review, the LEP will be awarded more money to look at continuing that program as well. Um, we're working closely with the LEP, uh, both LEPs in terms of feeding in SMEs from our sector who are interested in digital technologies. Then we've got the Manufacturing Made Smarter program, which is um, probably more of interest for some of the larger organisations. And that's 147 million um, of funding through Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. And um, there's four main key, uh, four uh, main um, themes for that. Smart factories, connected supply chain, adoptable, flexible and manufacturing and skills and design made tests. So there's been uh, two calls uh, currently to look at setting out ecosystems. So there's been a, a successful connected supply chain bid, which was uh, won by the uh, Digital Catapult and their consortia. Um, we've been feeding into that, but we're, we're not an active participant in it, but we will feed companies into, into the supply chain opportunities there. The one that really is more of interest to the automotive sector is smart factories. We want to get the factories connected first before we then look at the, the supply chain, connected supply chain opportunities. And we've been supporting a, a bid with the high value manufacturing catapult to look at setting up a uh, an ecosystem across the UK with about 18 partners involved in that. We will expand that network. The plan is to grow it if we are successful. Um, and it's about 50 million uh, projects, the vast majority of which is to look at funding industry led projects for industrial digitalization. And then we've got the, the made, uh, made smart uh, um, technology accelerator, which is looking at taking industry challenges out to uh, solution providers and getting uh, the solution providers and manufacturers to work together to develop innovative solutions to help improve their business and give them that competitive edge and then enabling the solution provider to then roll that out into the market as well. Um, just alongside that as well, we've, we've also got some funding um, uh, to support SMEs with the adoption piece as well. So one of the things we're keen to do is align additional programs. So a company who gets support is getting support from multiple programs, but the, the company doesn't see that we're 
pulling this together in the background. So all they see is seamless support and an intervention that makes a significant di uh, difference to their business. So just in terms of the, the last area I wanted to highlight um, is around connected autonomous logistics. Um, this came about um, really in terms of understanding the innovation journey that Nissan was on. And as I've mentioned, operational efficiency has been the backbone of our region's ability to win new investment and win new products. And we want to ensure we, we continually drive that and remain ahead of the game in, in order to win that future business. 5G Cal or Connected Autonomous Logistics grown out of Nissan's continual drive for operational efficiency and particularly in terms of looking at how they can um, innovate around uh, logistics. So it goes back to 2007 when they uh, first looked at deploying indoor AGVs. Uh, they went to the market, couldn't find a, a solution that was suitable to their needs that, that met their, their cost targets, but also met their operational targets as well. The, the solutions out there were either couldn't meet the operational targets and the OEE they required, or they were too expensive. So they actually went ahead and de uh, developed their own, the now on um, uh, version three of that, and they've got a, something like 184 deployed across the, the plant. And that accumulative savings, well over 7 million um, of saving to them through the use of those. The next phase of that was looking at how they could automate uh, logistics between various shops of the plant. And again, they went out to the market, there was nothing suitable, they secured some funding through Innovate UK, developed their own um, outdoor AGV, have now deployed two of those um, on, and are looking at how they deploy more of those across the plant. And then the next phase of that was to look at how they can automate the logistics from uh, on-site suppliers and near-site suppliers. And they did a, a study to look at the, uh, the benefit of doing that between Nissan and Vantec and there were some substantial savings to be had just through looking at automating those, uh, the, that logistics. So um, with the consortia, we um, work closely uh, with Sunderland Council or highlighted this opportunity was in, in the first instance. And then we brought together a consortia um, to bid into uh, Department for um, Culture, Media and Sport under their 5G uh, Create um, Testbed and Trials Programme. And we were um, successful in securing 2.4 million of DCMS funding towards a, a 4.9 million project. And that's looking at a, a pilot to automate a, a single HGV operating on a, on a route, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but in order to achieve the, um, the cost savings for this, we uniquely had to look at removing the safety driver from the vehicle. When you look at most of the connected autonomous mobility trials, they will have a safety driver in the vehicle. That defeats the purpose of why, why we're doing this, um, this project. It's about removing costs, removing drivers out of the vehicles and automating them. So we needed a system uh, to develop a system to allow a remote, con uh, a remote driver to be able to take control of that vehicle if it came across abnormal conditions. So we re required uh, teleoperation. We're doing that through developing the solution on a mule before then looking at scaling it up onto a 40 ton HEV truck, which has been electrified. So we will actually be the, the first project that we know of um, globally. We're, we're trying to um, double check these facts, but we, we were not aware of any other, nor is uh, a, a number of people were involved with, um, aware of any other project who's looking at a zero emission automated logistics vehicle operating in a live manufacturing environment. And, and obviously because we're operating in a live manufacturing environment, telecoms and cyber security is absolutely paramount. And we built in additional safety with vehicle to infrastructure. So the truck itself will be able to operate on the route autonomously. With the teleoperation, it can take over control of that vehicle um, if it comes across an abnormal condition. But with the V2I, what we've done is looking at expanded that safety case and 
and given the uh, the system a much broader uh, awareness of the the surrounding um, surrounding areas as well, so we can predict uh, predict um, obstacles or or issues there. And this really is hopefully will be the catalyst of us developing a a test bed for automated logistics here in the northeast and working with partners on that. And uh, again, I'll come on to it in a second. So just in terms of the trial route, you can see the trial route there highlighted in green and, uh, and orange. It's a very simple trial route. The only um, area where there's any interaction with road infrastructure really is uh, this junction here. And also uh, at the top when it comes off onto another junction. Um, the orange lines um, show where we're looking at demonstrating the uh, teleoperation system. So in the top right hand corner, we'll have a remote safety driver who will um, uh, reverse park the truck onto a loading bay. Um, and what you can't really see greatly in, uh, in the diagram in the top right hand corner is in, just to, to the side of the orange lines, those barriers, there's very little room between the sides of a, uh, of a truck and those barriers. So it's the accuracy required to, to reverse into there is phenomenal. And again, on the, the bottom right hand corner, we're also going to demonstrate how the truck self parks itself, reversing onto a loading bay, faced with the same challenges with the barri uh, barriers as well. For those interested in uh, how we're doing that, um, 5G is absolutely critical to this project, and we wouldn't be able to do it without 5G because the, the 5G allows us to, uh, it provides us with that low latency in order to. Uh, allow a tele the, the teleoperation um, system to work. For those interested, we're using um, off Ofcom shared spec uh, shared access spectrum M77, and following a competitive tender, North or an Internet of Things service and solution provider were awarded design build uh, and support of the uh, 5G installation. North themselves partnered with Nokia. Um, and we were using the Nokia Digital Automation Cloud or NDAC system to create a standalone 5G private network. And to give you an idea of, uh, of the performance we're getting out of this, which is, is still being fine tuned, but from the very first test we did on it, the 4G, 4G latency was around 150 milliseconds. With 5G, we've recorded uh, on, on our initial test 20 milliseconds. And that's that's a huge uh, amount of time saving, um, and is why we need five G for for um, for this solution. In terms of the autonomous system, um, it's as I mentioned, it's been developed on the uh, EMV two hundred test mule vehicle, which just happens to be a Nissan, and it's the one that um, Street Drone owned. Um, we'll develop the auton autonomous software and teleoperation. Um, in parallel with the uh, Turberg uh, vehicle conversion, and to help speed up the um, the development of the software, we're using simulation, including vehicle in the loop simulation, to verify the autonomous software performance along the the, the live route. And you can see that in the in the centre there. From a tele operation perspective. Um, as I mentioned, most CAM operations do rely on the safety driver, but it's critical for this project. We we'll remove that safety driver and put them in a in a, in, a, in a in a room. Um, that really is the USP, and really why Turberg uh, came on board as the, the vehicle partner for this project. They've recognised that actually um, they've all they're already getting customer demand from a number of operators, um, both within ports, airports logistic hubs um, for teleoperation because, as you can imagine, with, with, with the type of um, uh, uh, vehicle journeys that are being done within those environments, if you take an airport as, a, as a, an example, actually the, um, the use of drivers is very inefficient. The driver drives along, parks alongside a, an aeroplane and waits while that vehicle has been loaded or unloaded. Um, there's demand now for teleoperation, so a remote driver, in effect, could drop off a vehicle, take control of another one while the other's being loaded up, and there's a much more efficient use of, uh, of driver time. 
we predict in some of the um, areas we're, we're exploring that we could potentially remove nine drivers out of out of ten in those type of uh, scenarios. So there's a huge opportunity to deploy the this type of technology within those closed um, controlled environments uh, where there's an inefficient use of drivers. Then. Lastly, just in terms of the scale of, uh, of the opportunity, um, in terms of future development, we are working with um, a, a number of organisations and funders about how we can scale this. So there's interest in, uh, in proving the technology at scale. So we're looking at the existing uh, pilot route, which currently has 13 HUVs operating on that route. And we're looking at how we could potentially automate all of those 13 by 2025. Um, we're also looking at more challenging routes, so probably looking to take uh, finished vehicles off the bottom of the uh, the Nissan uh, facility there along a private road into the UK car compound, currently being done by 12 drivers. Um, we're looking at that would then, um, the, the vehicles would encounter roundabout security gates, bridges, traffic lights. So would take the and help enable us to develop those technologies, the autonomous uh, technologies uh, along that route. And then the, the other um, scenario we're looking at is deploying it in a new industrial setting, potentially a port where there's not as much road infrastructure and, and basically they, for those who are aware within a, in, within a port environment, if you, it's usually a, a large slab of, uh, of concrete with vehicles crossing from everywhere. So it's a very, very different challenge for the software to, to manage that situation. But in running those developments alongside each other, we will accelerate the move towards uh, developing the system up to a, a TRL level that's going to be acceptable for public road trials. And then further down the, the opportunity, we're then looking at how we can automate the near side suppliers um, before um, and, and taking that onto the public road. It's whilst everything there is, is focused around um, uh, Nissan, we do recognize there's huge opportunities in, in all these other areas that we've identified and we're working with partners on that. And to looking at achieving that, we've been working with um, the, uh, the the main bodies in this area, so the likes of Zenzik and uh, the Centre for Connected Autonomous Vehicles. We've been featured in their um, the, their last two uh, comprehensive spending reviews. This is the one from a uh, year before, um, but we've been in the the more recent one, and we're hoping, if successful, that we will uh, secure funding to look at developing this test bed for. Uh, automated logistics here in the northeast. I'll just let this run out. So, in terms of in innovation, we we, we recognised a number of years uh, years ago that um, when you look at the UK innovation ecosystem, there's no real um, centre of, of excellence for manufacturing innovation in the northeast. CPI around process innovation, yes, but when you look at vehicle manufacturing and a traditional manufacturing layout, there's nothing, um, the closest to us is AMRC at Sheffield. It's probably more um, linked or suited towards the, the activities of MTC, which are, are down in the Midlands. So we've been working with a number of partners of how we can establish a, a innovation center here in the Northeast and then link it to the wider UK ecosystem. So. Just to give you an example of that, um, this is how we would link into HVMC. So we understand the, the, the capabilities of each of the, uh, the centres. We take industry challenges into those centres, uh, uh, from uh, the northeast into those centres and bring the best solution forward. But as I say, this uh, is just demonstrating the links into HVMC. We know solutions will come from universities, from SMEs, from multinationals. Um, from the likes of Siemens, Accenture and, and organisations like that, and also other sectors uh, as well. Um, we, we truly recognise that other sectors have probably faced some of the challenges we're facing before. So if we can pick up best practice from those organisations, fantastic. 
But in order to do that, we really do need to understand where innovation capability lies in order to bring the best solutions forward to meet the challenges of industry. Just to give you an insight into some of the thoughts we've been doing. So if we take, we're, we're really wanting to drive um, innovation and, uh, and R&D linked into industry challenges. So we, we, along with networks and other organizations can look at identifying these in industry challenges. We can then look at driving um, that research and innovation through academic research, SMEs, catapult companies, etc. Attract more public sector funding to uh, to support those innovation and therefore de-risk the innovation for uh, companies. We're certainly looking at building on the 5G Create program and also Sunderland City Council's recent announcement about um, releasing 5G across the city centre and really develop some truly uh, nationally significant programmes around key areas that you can see there. Um, we've already done a number of them in terms of 5G enabled uh, automated logistics, zero emission automated logistics. Um, we've got trials for connected ITS and smart traffic management uh, taking place in the Northeast. Um, we're linked into the connected supply chain. Um, we're part of this uh, Made Smarter Smart Factory bid. Hopefully we'll be successful in that. And that's really looking at um, creating a place for the Northeast to innovate and crystallize recent regional assets around the delivery of decarbonization, leveling up, et cetera. And it's all about building regional capability, but ultimately driving that competitiveness across industry. And that's the, the last slide. Any, any questions? Uh, yes, there's one here from uh, Joanne. Uh, it says, you've mentioned that the Northeast has significant skills and elements of the supply chain to meet the future requirements of the UK automotive industry. With talk of increased onshoring, are there any gaps in the supply chain that entrepreneurial SMEs or others might fill? Uh, the second yeah. part of the question, well, do you want to comment on that first? Uh, yeah, and it, there's definitely opportunity. And I think um, given the pace of change within the automotive sector at the moment, there's, be, there's no better time for new entrants into the sector. I think previously it's been a, a sector that's difficult for companies to break into. But now, given the pace of change, given the change in technologies, there's no better time for companies to, to look at uh, entering the market. Undoubtedly, we're seeing a lot more uh, onshoring. We've got examples of um, uh, even with the existing tier ones who've uh, brought production back into the UK when they'd invested in new facilities uh, in Eastern Europe, um, that's come back. And actually, um, despite the fact we have a, a higher labour cost, we're deliver they, they are delivering the, the, a better quality part um, in terms of the, the quality performance, but also uh, in terms of cost with um, a third less of the employees as well, such as our, um, our capability. But undoubtedly, there's a lot of opportunity out there. And uh, we're certainly working with organizations through um, various programs to look at how we can support companies entering the market, but also how companies can expand in this, uh, in this sector too. Uh, the second part of Joanne's question is about opportunities for the process industry. You mentioned rare earth products. Any others? They definitely, and I, and I think we're going to see uh, a lot more closer work in between um, the, the auto, automotive industry and the chemical industry. So we've seen the, um, the two announcements of the gigafactories here in, in the Northeast with Envision and British Vault. To give you an idea of the scale of those facilities, so Envision current production is about 1.9 gigawatt hour. Um, each of the new facilities will be at, at 9 gigawatt hour when they first start. So we've got 18 gigawatt hour of, of production capability in the northeast. Um, the UK probably requires about 75 um, uh, gigawatt hour of capability. Once those two facilities are up to their um, uh, their full capacity, 
then we're probably looking about 65, um, 65 gigawatt hour of production just in the northeast. Now, when you've got the, the scale of opportunity there, I do expect to see both cathode and anode manufacturing come to the northeast. And undoubtedly, because we benefit from a, uh, a very strong chemical industry, I have no doubt that we'll see those companies locate down uh, in Teesside. So that's just two of the, the, the more immediate. We do see with, with light weighting, with uh, material science, uh, etc. We'll, we'll, we'll see a lot more um, uh, opportunity uh, to work closer with the automotive industry. With this sort of move towards electric vehicles, both on site and, and public vehicles and that, and presumably with a lot more digitization and automation, um, electricity consumption is going to increase. I know it's not strictly your remit, but is anybody actually working on increasing the electricity supply? Um, it, it's a good point because we, we are stretched and there, there's a lot of um, initiatives taking place now to look at how they can increase, uh, increase the, the capacity. And I think part of that solution will be around um, um, uh, coming off the grid and self-generation. Um, and we'll we'll see that with the announcement with Nissan, they're going to build a micro grid for Nissan, the in International Advanced Manufacturing Park, and some of the surrounding area there. Um, we we'll see more companies look at self generation um, as well. But then you you've got the opportunities uh, uh, looking at second life battery use to look at storing um, energy as well. So we can, where at the moment we within the UK we do have peaks of demand. We can look at trying ironing out those peaks through different technologies, through storing energy, uh, uh, etc. And um, there's a lot of go a lot of things going on. I know Nissan have been involved in projects where they're looking at um, vehicle to grid. So you, you can envisage going forward that an electric vehicle will be uh, charged overnight um, using energy that's been stored um, through the solar panels in second life batteries somewhere. Charged over uh, charged overnight there. Um, when you come back and plug it in, um, the the vehicle will actually put electricity into the grid uh, to try and balance out that um, that demand at peak periods. So it'd be a much more efficient uh, um, system. What are we going to do with all the scrap batteries? Uh, there's, there's a lot of activity going on on those, so looking at recycling, reusing um, batteries as well. So there's a number of projects. Um, there's some activity going on in, in the northeast. There's a new um, initiative, uh, the Northeast uh, Battery Alliance, which has been formed. It's uh, Colin Herron um, uh, from Zero Carbon Futures, and now within Newcastle University, that's working in that space. And this is some of the things they, they are looking at, but industry is obviously aware of, of this challenge. It, they do contain rare earth materials, and if we can recycle some of those and reuse, uh, fantastic. But they, they are looking at that entire um, uh, circular economy for, for batteries. Good, I'm pleased at that, because I was worried they would all go to landfill. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? There's uh, nothing else appeared in the chat box. Uh, if you could stop sharing your screen, Paul, uh, might be able to see a few more people. Um, if anybody wants to uh, to wave at us, a few people seem to have disappeared because I think they had to go at seven. Uh, everybody so, else switched. There are to their a, there, sorry to interrupt. There's a couple there, of are, questions there are a few on. other questions on the side. Yeah. Craig's okay. asked a question and Marcus has. Oh, I'm sorry, comments. I must have missed those. Oh, I see, they've gone at the top. Yes. Um, sorry, I had a bit of chit chat with somebody who had a sound problem. Uh, oh, that's strange. Oh, here we are. Yes, from Craig. In regards to a regional catapult organisation, is there a drive to build one by the NEAA, as you say? Is the passion already matched by local universities? Yes, uh, there is. We've been working very closely with the, the universities to look at how we, we do this. And um, I think one of the things what uh, we, we need to do is, is 
um, work with the universities to to change some of their uh, focus more towards the needs of industries and what what you traditionally seen within a lot of academic circles is the research has focused on areas of interest for the academics themselves and not as much towards the industry challenges and the applications there. So we're working with those organizations to look at how we can support that. We're looking at how we can work closer with the, the HVMC catapults to, to really develop the capability within the, the local universities to support that ambition. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Marcus. Um, great to see such cutting edge innovation taking place here close to home. As a, a Luddite late adopter who drives a 10 year old petrol car, the economics of buying an electric vehicle at 10 times the price just doesn't seem to add up to me. Will Moore's law, new one on me, apply such that e vehicle purchase costs fall in a reasonable time scale? They need to halve, I'd say. Yeah, un undoubtedly, the, we, we, we will see um, a fall in the, the comparative rates between uh, for electric vehicles as as we produce more, the cost of production does uh, does definitely re uh, reduce. Um, what I would say is there's an awful lot more technology going into cars uh, nowadays, um, and you'll see just the, the cost of petrol vehicles of, of, of increasing significantly as well uh, over that period. Um, there are, I believe, still some incentive schemes around electric vehicles, but we, we do, as more and more competition comes into the market, undoubtedly competition will drive down cost. Um, again, just going back to um, some of the, the, the uh, stats of late, last month, 44% of all new car sales were electrified. That's a huge, huge move. It's from about 20% this time last year uh, and the year before in the single figures. So a huge move towards electrified vehicles now. But I think that's reflective of the fact there's a lot more um, uh, availability out there. If we yeah, just I'll... overcome this issue on semiconductors and we can get back to producing um, normally, there'll be even more um, uh, uh, vehicles out there. Yes, it'd be interesting to see how long it takes for electric vehicles to become cheaper than petrol vehicles. Although I guess uh, if we're not making any more petrol vehicles after 2030, there'll be a, sort of an artificial element to the, the price war, won't there? Yeah, yeah. you'll probably find, as I, as I said in the, uh, in, in the speech, you'll probably find most OEMs will stop offering a petrol vehicle by 2025. So if I want another petrol car, I'd better buy it quick. Then. Current one's two years old. Uh, yeah, I would still be very nervous about setting off for Devon in an electric car, I think, until the situation improves dramatically. Uh, there was a question from Joanne that I've missed. Uh, what sort of chemicals and materials will be needed for the cathodes, anodes, separators, etc.? Good question, and what, not one I'm, uh, uh, I could answer myself. Um, unfortunately, but there's, um, if you go to the Advanced Propulsion Centre website, they have uh, a number of technology roadmaps, which does break down where the opportunities are. Um, and there's also some good contacts with an APC who are working closer with the chemical sector on, on this. So I'd be able to find that out, but unfortunately I can't answer that um, currently myself. Okie doke. Uh... Mm. Well, I think if nobody else has any more uh, questions, uh, do you want to say a few words at all, Joanne? Joanne's gone. Yeah, quiet. I need to, I need to unmute myself first. I, I'm only really just to help for for the really interesting lecture and um, bringing a lot of people up to date with what's what's been going on in the automotive industry. As if down on Tisa, we don't always hear um, hear about all these wonderful initiatives and um certainly i'll we'll be cascading this information further as well um that's all i really wanted to say so thank you very much over to you sue well yes i'll just echo that again thank you very much paul it's certainly heartening to hear that there is so much going on because certainly my perception before this lecture was that ooh, you know electric vehicles 
uh, coming fairly soon. Uh, is anybody actually doing anything? But it's nice to know that, yes, people are actually doing things and are thinking about things that, you know, we've discussed amongst ourselves. So thank you very much indeed for that, Paul. I would say if, if you get the opportunity to go on a test drive for an electric vehicle, it's phenomenal. Completely yeah, different. Yeah, I've never driven one. So, uh, so I, I do see Teslas whizzing past me on the motorway, though. So, and and more <laughs> and more of them. So, uh, I suppose the forty-four percent of new car sales is maybe not quite so surprising. And obviously, there are other electric vehicles that are less noticeable. Well, the the number one new car um, last month was a Tesla. I'm not surprised that I saw about seven or eight on my last trip down to, to Devon, so in each direction, so uh, certainly a lot more. Thank you very much indeed, Paul, no and problem. thanks everybody for coming. Say good night to you all. Thank you.